All right, greetings everybody and welcome to my continued series on uh, themes of the 20th century. We are going to be moving away from Europe and uh, North America at this time and move to the southern tip of uh, the African continent, South Africa. Now certainly many of you that are watching these, uh, maybe students in high school or early university, uh, most of you were probably born in sort of the early 21st century and would really have no memory of, of, of the apartheid system or even a memory of this man here, Nelson Mandela. But it's fair to say that in the 1980s, uh, during sort of the second half of the 1980s, uh, the issues in South Africa really kind of begin, began to crop up to the forefront of, of Western society. A lot of discussions about what's happening down there. And a lot of hostility, too, um, when people began to understand exactly what apartheid meant. So what I want to do for this lecture is kind of walk you through the steps that lead up to it. Because, you know, one of the wonderful things with history uh, is that, you know, with every period that we study, there's always, a, there's always events that lead up to that. So there's this sort of constant cycle of going back and back and back, you know. And I like to say, with history, um, that the more you learn, the more, the more you realize how little you know, and th which can be very frustrating at times, but also kind of keeps you actively looking and studying and reading. And, uh, uh, you know, there, there's no end to history, and um, it's what makes it so compelling as well. But for our purposes today, we're going to be looking at specifically South Africa, and we're also going to be looking at um, the rise of uh, this man here, Mr. Nelson Mandela, who would, interestingly enough, become the president of South Africa. So, All right, so let's go back to early days of uh, colonial and imperial rule of South Africa. In 1652, a century and a half after the discovery of the Cape Sea route, the Dutch East India Company founded a refreshment station at what would become Cape Town. Okay, so uh, basically 1652 is pretty early in the colonial experience. I mean, certainly the English and the French have been fairly active, uh, particularly in the New World and what would later become Canada and the United States. Um, but, you know, originally uh, Holland or the Netherlands, the Dutch, <laughs> interesting we've got those three reference names we can use, um, were really quite interested in Indonesia. And, you know, if you're traveling from uh, the Netherlands all the way around Europe, past the Straits of Gibraltar, and all the way down Africa to the southern tip and then across Indonesia, that is a heck of a long trip. Later, when we get to the building of the Suez Canal, you'll be able to understand why that canal was so important to uh, particularly the British and their interests in India. But basically, what happens is you get this uh, company, the Dutch East India Company, that begins to develop a presence in South Africa. Because if you are going to um, have colonies uh, in Indonesia, you're going to need to have some pretty clear lines of communication. You, you need refreshment stations, you need a place to stop, you need a place to rest, to get clean water, to get fresh food, and so on and so forth. So when you are a colonial power, you do need a network of lines of communication. And what's interesting is once this Dutch East India Company is formed and there's a bit of a Dutch presence, later Dutch, German, and French Calvinists, predominantly farmers, move there for economic opportunities and fleeing persecution in Europe. Once the Dutch had established this presence, there were, of course, Calvinists throughout Europe. And, and I don't want to get too much into that history because I will be discussing those things when I talk about the Reformation. I have a lecture on the Reformation, but a very, very sim simplistic um, Coles Notes version for our purposes right now is that after Luther's Reformation, which is triggered by the 1517 event where he hammers those that... Uh, uh, theses in uh, the cathedral at Wittenborg in Germany, uh, criticizing the power and the control of the Catholic Church at the time, a series of events begins to evolve where Lutheranism becomes very, very popular. Well, from Lutheran, which is sort of the primary source, if you will, of the Protestant Reformation, you get branches, right, that are sort of taking um, 
the, the essence of the Reformation, of Luther's Reformation, and then making adaptations. Of course, the Calvinists were one group. Um, but the Calvinists were certainly being discriminated against uh, throughout much of Europe. Now, of course, they were predominantly focused in France and in Switzerland, in Zurich. And, uh, uh, but those that were in Holland, or there were, there were a scattering of German Calvinists, they were being discriminated against, and they thought, well, this is an opportunity for us to get out of here. Uh, it's beautiful weather in South Africa. There are Dutch refreshment stations down there. There already is a European presence, and there's great land for farming. So uh, that's what happens there. And Britain became interested in ensuring the Cape did not fall into French hands during the Napoleonic Wars, and fought a war against the Boers in which they won. Quite a leap, it's going from 1652, when we're talking about the Napoleonic Wars, roughly sort of, uh, you know, 1797, I think, is when the Italian campaign starts, right up into 1815 at the end of the Battle of Waterloo, 1814-1815. So Britain, the reason they wanted to make sure that, that South Africa did not fall into French hands, because it would inhibit their ability to maintain those lines of communications with India, which had fallen under British control by this time. Um, in fact, I think it's roughly 1757 when Britain would defeat the French at the Battle of Plassey, I think the name of it was. And of course, uh, for Great Britain, you know, uh, India was the crown jewel. And this is before the Suez Canal, so the way in, Brit the way in which Britain got to South Africa was all the way down the southern Cape and across. So where they need to go down there, take control, and of course the Boers, the Dutch farmers are thinking, well, who are, what are you guys doing here? You know, well, we're here because we can't let this fall into French hands. So it went to war with the Boers, and of course the British would win. A pattern would soon emerge because once the British establish a presence, then they are encouraging um, uh, British subjects to come to move to this colony. I always kind of see the South Africa situation with the Dutch being there first and then the British coming very similar to the Quebec situation where the French had had a strong, robust presence in Quebec. Uh, they had the fur trade, they had a, a thriving royal colony for 150 years before the British would overtake that colony. So there's striking uh, similarity between those experiences of of one European colony being taken over by a, another European country, in this case the British. So what happens is after 1815 when Britain takes control of this southern colony, if you will, a pattern soon emerges whereby English speakers became highly urbanized, they would dominate politics, trade, finance, mining and manufacturing, while the largely uneducated Boers were relegated to their farms. Now. From the position of the Afrikaners, as the Boers are also known, the Boers and the Afrikaners, they were farmers anyway, but what ends up happening is that the British end up taking control of largely the coastal areas where they can maintain those lines of communication with all their colonies. And of course, with the British presence comes money, comes skilled tradespeople and skilled people in finance and government and so on and so forth. So they begin to develop a relatively robust um, colony at the same time that the Boer farmers are sort of maintaining, they're trying to maintain their farm life. And this situation comes to a bit of a head a little later and we can see we're going to have some tension. So as we said, Britain took possession of the Cape in 1815 after a war with France. And when Britain outlawed slavery in the colony in 1834, this is interesting, um, the Dutch Boers left the Cape to form their own republics in the interior. Natal, Orange Free State, and the Transvaal. Okay, so it was a combination of the Boers protesting the idea that they would be expected to abolish slavery too. Uh, there was a pretty strong relationship between the economies of the Boers and the local indigenous population, um, where largely the indigenous population, if you will, was in servitude of the Dutch Boers and later the British as well, even though they would outlaw slavery. So what happens 
after the 1834 situation is that the Dutch Boer say, okay, you know what, enough already. We are going to move north and create our own independent republics separate from you guys. You guys can stay down south, stay on the coastal areas, and we're going to go up north and, and, and keep our own rules. We don't want to have our uh, republics dictated by the British. So that's what happens. And basically, if you look on this map, uh, it's kind of fuzzy here, but it's sort of up in this area is where there's the Transvaal, the Orange Free State. They're all up in the interior. By the 1890s, the Boers were located largely in areas where they resisted integration with other Europeans. So what happens, a pattern develops where the Dutch, the Boers, um, are quite bitter and resentful of a continued flood of colonists coming to, to the Republic. And as, as some began to move up into their Dutch Boer Republics, they became very, very... Um, concerned about that, with good reason. They called them Utlanders. But then something happens. <laughs> and oh my gosh, if we look in the history, how much history of warfare and violence has revolved around um, the discovery of diamonds or gold, or just chaos. You look at the gold rush, the Caribou gold rush in British Columbia. You look at the, the gold rushes in California. Uh, of 1849 and so on and so forth. I mean, the discovery of diamonds brought a flood of foreigners to the area, you know, the Yukon Gold Rush as well. Uh, tensions grew in the Transvaal where, where British immigrants were outnumbering the Boers. Okay, now the Boers are feeling vulnerable, just like the French Canadians as the British began to import or bring in more British colonists. When Britain takes over control of Quebec after 1759 and the Plains of Abraham, do you think they're encouraging more French to come live in Quebec? No. They want to shut the door on the French and they want to bring in more British. So that slowly over time, the French become acculturated with the, French, you know, with the English. And slowly over time, uh, the French will all be Anglicans and speaking English. Um, you know, so... The Boers are feeling definitely vulnerable, but what's unfortunate now is you now have gold and diamonds in these Dutch republics, which eventually is really the primary cause of the Boer War. The Boer War was a lengthy war involving large numbers of troops from many British possessions, uh, which ended with the conversion of the Boer republics into British colonies, right? So... The British fought directly against the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, and the bloodshed that was seen during the war was alarming. Two of the factors that contributed to this were, first, many of the British soldiers were physically unprepared for the environment, and they were poorly trained for the tactical conditions they faced. Okay, let's pause for a moment here, because I think there's some things that need to be clarified. In the history of British and French colonialism, and we're going to focus on the British here for our purposes, when Britain went overseas with their navies and their cannons and their artillery, it was relatively easy to overcome less developed societies. Now, to be clear, this has nothing to do with race, but has everything to do with gunpowder. What I mean by that is that if the British could go to Hong Kong, shoot off a few cannons, scare the heck out of the local population, it would be relatively easy to overtake them. You have far superior uh, military, ammunition, and gunpowder. Um, so what I'm suggesting here is that for the most part in the experience of British imperialism, it, it, it wasn't terribly difficult for Britain to continue to go to all four corners of the world and take over regions of areas where people were less developed because they were not in a position to be able to defend themselves, you know. And one of the great ironies, of course, is that many of the more remote civilizations that had never met Europeans before thought initially they were gods. So the Europeans were able to walk all over these people. Because, and then, of course, when they realized they weren't gods, it was too late. Just look at the the experience uh, in, uh, in Mexico and Latin America at the hands of the conquistadors of the Spanish. So that 
story is pretty uh, pretty uh, horrific uh, what happened there but uh, so what I'm trying to lead to here is that Britain over the previous two three hundred years of colonialism had had a pretty easy go of going anywhere they wanted and taking over parts of the world with relative ease but now they're facing a group of people who are very well trained in firearms, they're farmers, they're hunters, they're Europeans, and that's not why they're they're great, but it's 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 they had access to the kinds of technology that the British were using themselves, is what I'm getting at here. And Great, Great Britain was not used to fighting a protracted colonial war against an enemy that knew its territory so well that they, in fact, the Boers became masters of guerrilla warfare, and the British had no idea how to deal with that. They never faced an enemy like that. In addition to that, the British are having to remain in South Africa for quite some time. They're exposed to disease. They're getting very, very sick. Uh, many are dying, and um, the Boers are running circles around them. And now, not in full frontal assaults. This was sort of guerrilla tactics. One of the things I think um, happened is um, also germ warfare. You know, I think the Boers were known to dump a dead carcasses of horses and animals into the rivers that were flowing down towards British encampments, so that when the British would drink the water, um, they would become extremely ill and in, in cases, in many cases, die. So, it, you know, <laughs> the British found themselves in this extremely hot climate and unable to drink the water from the river knowing that it was being intentionally polluted in a type of germ warfare. So, so the Boers were tough as nails and they were not going to give in and I think Britain was unprepared. I've always kind of seen the British adventure in South Africa similar to the American intervention in Vietnam, this very, very strong, major world power that is simply unable to overtake a largely farmer-based community, rural community in these republics. What happens is the British, out of desperation, resort to a policy of scorched earth and civilian internment, adopted by the British in response to the Boer guerrilla campaign, ravaged the civilian populations in the Transvaal and Orange Free State. This is where things get a little bit ugly. And, you know, it's not a period of history that Great Britain is proud of. And nor am I suggesting, um, you know, that this was the right or wrong thing to do. But this was a major colonial power that found itself in a desperate situation. So what they do is they basically intern the women and children, the wives and children, of the Boer soldiers they're fighting by going into villages and basically rounding up families and putting them in these internment camps. Now these internment camps were not death camps, it was nothing like that, but they end up holding so many Boer civilians that they don't have the, the ability to maintain proper supply of food and medicine to these people that they have got essentially under a form of house arrest and you get a, a situation where civilians begin to die in these British camps. Britain pursued the policy of rounding up and isolating the Boer civilian population into concentration camps, and I use that term loosely, that's what they were called, but to be very clear, these were not World War II type of uh, concentration camps. The wives of and children of the Boer guerrillas were sent to these camps with poor hygiene and little food, although this was remedied to some extent as time went on. The death and suffering of the civilians, according to many scholars, is what broke the guerrillas' will. So this war could have continued, this guerrilla warfare tactic, you know, and the Boers were so devastated by having their families in prison that eventually they gave up. But on the ground, from a tactical military perspective, the Boers never really lost because this was an unusual war. You know, this was Boers in the hills late in the evening going down into encampments, blowing up supplies, killing a few people and retreating back to the hills. You know, we've seen guerrilla warfare being used throughout history. The Viet Cong, of course, in South Vietnam, uh, the Spanish during the uh, Napoleon 
invasion there, the Spaniards resorted to guerrilla warfare. And uh, so, I mean, it's basically all you've got when you can't face an enemy with a full frontal assault. So, this war led to a change from splendid isolation policy to a policy that involved looking for allies and improving world relations. Basically, what happens is that when word begins to trickle out, of what the British are doing in South Africa, it becomes kind of a, an unpopular war. I mean, the propaganda was, we're going there to defend British interests. But British subjects wouldn't have really understood what was happening, how Golden Diamonds was impacting this, because that's what the British were really after. Oh my gosh, there's all those Golden Diamonds in the Boer Republics. We need to get that, so we need to find a reason to go to war. Um, you know, some 1,500 Canadian volunteers went because they were doing the duty for the empire. So, you, you know, most people that became volunteers that fought in the Boer War really didn't understand what was going on. And when they did, and they saw conditions like these camps, I'm sure many of them were extremely upset. The Army Medical Corps, this is the British Army Medical Corps, discovered that 40% of men called for duty were physically unfit to fight. This was the first time in which the government was forced to take notice of how unfit the British Army was. And once again, it was because in the past they'd had very little difficulty taking over regions. So they were not used to this sort of protracted kind of a fight. So, All right, well the Boers were given three million pounds for reconstruction and were promised eventual limited self-government, which was granted only six years after the end of the Boer War. The treaty ended the existence of the South African Republic and the Orange Free State as independent Boer Republics and placed them within the British Empire, right? Much like Quebec, right? Uh, the Union of South Africa was established as a member of the Commonwealth in 1910. So, in many ways, I think the British peace terms, if you will, with the Boers were relatively generous for a nation that just defeated another nation. But I think it was a recognition that um, we don't want to give cause for the Boers to resurrect their anger and distaste because we don't want to go to war with them. A similar effect in, uh, with the British in Quebec when they enacted uh, the Quebec Act, which was very favorable, allowing the French to keep their Catholicism, their language, and so on and so forth. And understanding that you can, you can be the ruler of this area, but there's ways that you can prevent them from rising up against you. Is the best way to put it. So, in all, the war had cost around 75,000 lives. 22,000 British soldiers were killed, but only just under 8,000 of the 22 were battle casualties. The rest were through disease. Between six and 7,000 Boer fighters, and mainly the, in concentration camps, between 20 and 28,000 Boer civilians, mainly women and children. Okay, the highest casualty list or group in the South African War were women and children. And perhaps 20,000 black Africans, indigenous peoples, both on the battlefield and in the concentration camp. So, so that's where we're at. The Transvaal and the Orange Free State are now British colonies. And we move forward. Now... Um, the newly created uh, Union of South Africa was a dominion of Great Britain, and I keep using the analogy of Quebec because it's very similar. In 1931, the Union was effectively granted independence from the United Kingdom with the passage of the Statute of Westminster. And coming back to Canada, same situation in Canada there. We were now a self-governing uh, nation, and of course we achieved that to some degree in 1867. Uh, but now, the Statute of Westminster gives the colonies, the former Dominion, which were formerly colonies, now Dominion status and greater independence from Great Britain. In 1948, three years after World War II, the National Party was elected to power in South Africa. It intensified the implementation of racial segregation begun under Dutch and British colonial rule and subsequent South African governments since the Union was formed. And the nationalist government systemized existing segregationist laws, classifying all peoples into three races, 
developing rights and limitations for each, such as pass laws, residential restrictions. The white minority controlled the vastly larger black majority. The system of segregation became known collectively as apartheid. Apartheid is an institutionalized and, and a government built around the premise that, that it is a, a, a system of racial segregation. So, well, while the white minority enjoyed the highest standard of living in all of Africa, often compared to first world western nations, so if you lived in the center of Johannesburg or Cape Town, uh, you may not really see that many indigenous peoples, any Africans in, in the streets, you know. Um, if you lived in a white neighborhood, uh, you would be completely separate from the harsh realities that the majority of people were facing. The black majority remained disadvantaged by almost every standard, including income, education, housing, and life expectancy. On the 31st May 1961, following a whites-only referendum, the country became a republic and left the Commonwealth. That's interesting. Why would South Africa become completely free and independent from any connection with Great Britain through the Commonwealth? A lot of it had to do with the fact that by 1961, the apartheid government was beginning to fall under tremendous scrutiny from the United Nations and other nations of the world who were saying, wait a second here, how on earth can we allow a nation exist that separates its people so blatantly, you know, so brazenly, as apartheid did? Apartheid became increasingly controversial, leading to widespread international sanctions and growing unrest and oppression within South Africa. A long period of harsh repression by, suppression by the government and at times violent resistance in strikes, marches, protests and sabotage by bombing and other means by various anti-apartheid movements, most notably the most vocal and powerful group that developed was the African National Congress and from this point forward I'll refer to them as the ANC, the African National Congress. So it isn't surprising that when you create a, when, when, when the controlling power is a, a, a racial minority that basically creates uh, laws that puts them at a tremendous advantage over the vast majority of the indigenous population, um, you're going to have a problem. And all you have to do is look at um, events that le led up to the American Civil Rights Movement because it was very similar what was happening down there, although racism wasn't uh, uh, cast in law in the same way as it was in apartheid. It happened in the American South, it happened against the Constitution of the United States, but there, you had the, the, the Jim Crow laws in the United States, but here in South Africa this was from the top, the state had organized their society and written up their laws according to complete racial separation. So. Alright, well Nelson Mandela was such a central figure when I was growing up um, and you know particularly in the in the middle 1980s um, when things began to really kind of fire up so let's talk a little bit about Mandela first and I want to share some stories and experiences that I had as a young man in relation to South Africa so whoops so he was born a member of the Tembu people in 1918 um, his name was Ro Roli Hachwa, is the pronunciation, Roli Hachwa, which isn't that difficult to pronounce. Roli Hachwa Mandela became the first member of his family to attend a school where his teacher, Miss Dingain, gave him the name Nelson. Now what's funny about this is the Tembu people were largely rural agrarian people that lived sort of more inland. You know, he lived, Nelson Mandela grew up in a very idyllic, close-knit, loving community that was completely separated from the bigotry in the urban centers in the south and on the coastal areas. So he didn't grow up witnessing any evidence of racism. He grew up very, very, in a very beautiful train with, with a close community. When he goes to school, his teacher, is doing roll call and goes down the list and she gets to Roli Hakwa and she says Ro Roll Roli Okay, this is the spelling of the name. The last name is Mandela. Who is this please? 
and young Roly Hawkwa puts up his hand. You are now Nelson. And he went, oh, okay, I'm Nelson. And he goes home, of course, that day and says, Mom, you'll never guess what happened at school today. What, dear? I got a new name. What do you mean you got a new name? My teacher says my new name is Nelson. And uh, anyway, the name stuck. And uh, he got it from Miss Dingane, who uh, I think had difficulty pronouncing Roly Hawkwa. But anyway. He attended the University of Johannesburg, where he received a law degree and set up South Africa's first black legal practice. So he was kind of like, you know, his tribe, his father was one of the, the elders in this tribe, really wanted to connect their community with the outside world. So the best way to do that is to kind of, you know, find someone in the community that is showing signs of you know, ambition and hard work and charisma and ability to think critically and learn. And that was Mandela. And what's ironic is that even though there was tremendous racial separation in South Africa, I mean, if you had the money, you could still go to university, but very, very few uh, black Africans had the money to pay for university. So ironically, he does attend the University of Johannesburg and he gets a law degree and sets up his first South African first black legal practice. Now I'm jumping up quite a bit ahead here. That a couple of things to note. That when Nelson was a young man growing up and going to school in his early teen years, what he did notice was that when he saw his tribal elders and family talk about the white man, in a sort of, he almost could kind of detect a fear and he developed this sort of sense that the white man were these strange almost godlike beings that that had all this power that had all this control and you didn't cross them so even growing up as a young man he had a sense of what these white people were all about now when he gets to Johannesburg pow hits him right in the face whoa you know just like uh, Mahatma Gandhi in South, South Africa interestingly enough who experienced that kind of racism for the first time. Um, but for Mandela, same kind of thing. And of course, because he'd grown up in such a, a loving, open, dynamic environment, when he gets to Johannesburg, he's just completely repulsed by what he experiences and what he sees and what he's denied. And the combination of that becoming a lawyer, you know, oh my gosh, I mean, how many people in history have you heard, you've heard me say this if you've seen my other lectures, who become movers and shakers in history, who are lawyers. The list goes on. You know, Gandhi was a lawyer. Johnny MacDonald was a lawyer. Nelson Mandela was a lawyer. Louis Riel was a lawyer. Fidel Castro was a lawyer. So, I mean, you know, what is the connection between social change and law? I don't know. I mean, I guess the best way to try to make sense of it is that if you're a lawyer, you have a good understanding of constitutional law, or you should, and you can see very clearly in print how people's lives are being uh, inhibited by punitive laws. And uh, so it isn't surprising that people in the field of law can become advocates for change. And that, of course, would be Nelson Mandela. A combination of his profession and the discrimination he felt in Johannesburg turned him toward political activity. Now, as we said, the apartheid system was established in 1948, classified residents into four categories. You were either white, you were black, you were colored, or you were Asian. Now, depending on the complexion of your skin would almost determine the, the, the darker your skin, the more punitive the policies were. It's a pretty grotesque system that really inhibits your ability to excel in society based on the color of your skin. The purpose was to separate political, economic, and educational control from non-whites. And the African National Congress would emerge to fight segregation laws and Mandela would rise to the top by the early 60s. He was the only one. He opened up the first black pr practice in, 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 in Johannesburg. He has is, he is come to a political awakening when he comes to Johannesburg and becomes a lawyer. Uh, there are strikes and protests beginning. I mean, the stars were kind of lining up for Nelson Mandela to become sort of the, the, um, 
the poster boy, if you will, for lack of a better term, of social change in South Africa. Similar to the Martin Luther King situation, you know, these are people that are intelligent, well-educated, charismatic, um, speak with authority, so on and so forth. And that was Mandela. March 21st, 1960, the South African police fired on protesters in Sharpsville, killing 69 people. A horrible sight. Uh, these were unarmed protesters. And the incident created an international fur, and many foreign companies withdrew their investments. It was after 1960 when multinational corporations that had investments in South Africa began to say, wait a minute here. Does having investments in South Africa mean that we support this kind of thing? I think it's time to pull out. It's not surprising that it would be a year after Sharpsville that they would pull out of the Commonwealth, right? Because they were falling under greater scrutiny. A state of emergency was declared, the ANC was banned, and Mandela and other leaders would be imprisoned. So there he goes in prison, and you know, for all he knew, he was going to be tried and executed. So, after Sharpsville and certainly beyond, and particularly when we get to the, the, the protests of the 1960s, while South Africa may not have been so much on the radar in the States because Vietnam was taking up so much of the attention, um, major corporations are beginning to show their commitment to, to changing things in South Africa. Sanctions basically are actions directed at South Africa to force it to meet legal and moral obligations. General Motors and Kodak withdrew their operations. Musicians refused to play there and sports teams refused to do the same. Now, here's the interesting thing. South Africa could claim that nobody was allowed to interfere with how they ran their government because it was an internal matter. The United Nations is not supposed to intervene in countries uh, that are making decisions for the people within the borders of their countries, right? They're free to do as they see fit. Um, so it was a, probably a very difficult situation for the UN to deal with South Africa because, you know, uh, you couldn't really overtly criticize them, although you certainly you could criticize them, but there was nothing you could really do about it. What's interesting is that... Um, Despite the, the um, sanctions, some sports teams and some musicians continued to perform and play sports in South Africa. In South Africa, there was a, quite a, 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 a resort area called Sun City. And uh, Sun City was a famous spot for wealthy white South Africans to go to. And, uh, you know, performers would go from all over the world to play at Sun City. And unfortunately, some artists that I respect played quite a bit in Sun City. Eric Clapton played at Sun City. Canada's Rush played at Sun City. Um, what ends up happening is in the middle 1980s, a group of artists in America, I think um, people like Bruce Springsteen and Little Steven, who is Bruce Springsteen's guitar player, uh, Bono from U2, Sting, formerly of the police, and others came together and wrote a song called I'm Not Going to Play Sun City. I think it was about 85 or 86 when this song came out. That was my awakening that what is the deal with South Africa that these nations have to come together and say we refuse to play Sun City because they were protesting that their friends and colleagues in the music business, some of whom were having the audacity of performing there. And it was at this time, too, in 1986, where uh, Paul Simon records his masterpiece, Graceland, one of the great albums of the 1980s. And he got scrutinized because he went to South Africa to hire, um, he wanted to make an album with African rhythms and, 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 and music, and he was very inspired by African music. So he went to South Africa against the international sanctions, hired these musicians, recorded this album, and, you know, his defense was that, well, look, I just went there because I love the music and I'm a musician. And, you know, probably not the best time for her to do this, for him to do this, but at the end of the day, you know, we have that album, Graceland, which still is one of the great albums of that period. Um, just ever so quickly, my experience uh, also was that when I heard the song, I'm not going to play Sun City, I was in college at the time, I began to go to the library and read up on Nelson Mandela, there was a song that I'd heard on the radio called Free Nelson Mandela. 
which had a really great beat, a great bass line, and I thought, boy, what is this? What is this? This is a great song. Who is Nelson Mandela anyway? So it's interesting how music is what brought me to my appreciation and understanding of what was happening in South Africa. There was one time in particular where I was driving with a girlfriend in, in, in my town and uh, we were running out of gas and um, um, we needed to pull in, we were on E, needed to pull into a gas station. There was a Shell gas station. And um, I said, we got it, we're gonna run out. She says, don't go to Shell. I said, why not? She said, because they have investments in South Africa. And I thought, well, what are you talking about? I'll go in, I'll get $5 of gas, we'll go somewhere else and fill up. She said, okay, fine. So we went in and pulled up to the gas station, rolled down my window, and as a man came around to ask if, if he wants me to fill it up, my girlfriend at the time says, why do you guys have interest in South Africa? I thought, oh my gosh, please don't make a scene. This is just a, an employee at the gas station. And what's interesting is the, 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 the gas station attendant goes, oh, hold that thought one second. He runs into the office at the gas station, I see him talking to a manager, he comes back with a pamphlet and he gives me the pamphlet he said, this explains why Shell has interest in South Africa and it was kind of a checklist of what they're doing to ensure, you know, employment and they're doing ABC, it was like an, an apologist's um, uh, checklist as to why they continue to have interest in South Africa and that was another really focal point of my awakening of what was happening in South Africa, so music and multinational corporations. So, by the mid 1980s, sanctions were beginning to have an effect. Now, Mandela, going back now to 1961, is thrown in prison. And in 1962, he was jailed for five years, but he ends up in prison for 27 years on a rocky, desolate place called Robben Island, which is almost like South Africa's Alcatraz. It's an island completely separated from the mainland. And there he is. There's the limestone quarry, which we'll talk about, his cell. And this is Mandela going back to visit his home of 27 years um, before he was released. He was incarcerated on Robben Island, where he spent the first 18 of his 27 years on this island. While in jail, his reputation grew and he became widely known as the most significant black leader in South Africa. And it's interesting that in Robben Island, uh, uh, prisoners were segregated by race, with black prisoners receiving fewer rations. White prisoners got trousers, you know, black prisoners got shorts. White prisoners got two ounces of meat, African, or African prisoners got one. For 13 years straight, Every day for 13 years, prisoners at Robben Island went out to the limestone quarry and chipped rock. Just chipped it. And what's interesting is getting into the personality of Nelson Mandela. Every time he would go out to the limestone quarry, he would always greet his captors, you know, the prison guards, with respect. Hello, Bob, how are you? And at first they'd say, I don't want you talking to me. But then eventually, Mandela would win them over. Hey Bob, nice to see you. How's the family? How are the kids? And over time, the prison guards kind of came around because they something about him that was endearing. What's interesting at the limestone quarry that he and his, his comrades, many of whom were also in prison because of their involvement with the African National Congress, began to negotiate with the prison guards where they say, look, you know what, it's boiling hot out here. I'm going to chip for 10 or 15, then I'm going to sit down and take a breather, have a drink of water, and then I'll get up. Because if you want me to chip rock all day, I have to do it in a way that I don't die. And so Mandel was able to negotiate those kind of things. So for 13 years, while they chipped rock, they developed this rapport with their prison guards. And, you know, the hatred and bigotry that some of those prison guards may have felt, because that is what they had learned, had been eliminated after years and years and years of interacting with Nelson Mandela. And that, to me, is one of the, the remarkable stories of, of why Mandela is such a remarkable human being. On the island, he and others performed hard labor in the lime quarry. There it is up there. All right, well, there's the clerk here. 
became president of South Africa in 1989 and within a year repealed laws that enforced segregation, lifted the ban on the ANC, and freed Mandela in 1990. Now, I need to slow down here for a second. Because what happens is the longer that Mandela is in prison, he goes into prison in 62, he's released in 89, 27 years. People don't even know what he looks like anymore. The pictures that you have of Mandela, you know, ANC flags and portraits are Mandela circa 1962 and before. And what's interesting is that in the middle 80s, the South African government knew that they were going to eventually release Mandela. So what they do is he, when he, he, he's brought into the city, he's given sort of, he's living in house arrest in a, quite a nice home, and he's driven around Johannesburg and Cape Town and other places just to have a look at what South Africa looks like because he hasn't seen it in 27 years. And he was actually able to walk the streets of Johannesburg and nobody recognized him. And in fact, he could go to a shop, a tourist shop, let's say, whether it be, or, or like a flag shop, and there would be ANC flags and pictures of Nelson Mandela on a coffee cup, you know. Uh, there was, you know, incidents like him going into a shop and, and going to pick up a coffee cup and a lady going, oh, were you going to get that? And he says, no, I was just looking. Would you like to buy it? Yes, it's the last one. I really would like this Mandela cup. And he gives her the cup and off she goes and he thinks, my gosh, she doesn't even know I'm the guy in the coffee cup. Um, but that's the kind of thing. So he was kind of being slowly ready because what's happening to the South African government by the late 80s is that the economic pressure from sanctions, the disdain with which they're being held at by the rest of the world, the lack of business interests that are coming, everyone's pulling out, nobody's coming in, they're, they're becoming kind of a pariah state. Um, uh, so the clerk is the one who begins this process. He introduces new laws to end the partitioning of South Africa into separate racial states. In 1993, with the pressures of violence and bloodshed, the clerk agreed to national democratic elections for all citizens. Now, here's the thing, from apartheid's from the clerk and apartheid's perspective, why then? Why were they, after so many years of 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 this institutionalized racism, were they willing to pull back? Pressure was mounting, and here's the reality: you've got generations of South Africans, Boer, Boers, white South Africans, that want a place in South Africa after all this. So if you're the one, as the white apartheid government, that takes the lead on dismantling it, it may increase the possibility that the white population can maintain a presence after the end. Because it's not like they're going to go home. These are generations of people that have lived in South Africa since the 1600s. So that is their home. And, and you know, it's not like they're going to go back to Holland or, or France or wherever. So, um, so he very cleverly takes the initiative of allowing things to kind of strip down. And, and in terms of the day trips of Mandela, that's where it began. May 6, 1994, the ANC with Mandela as leader became the new government with 63% of the national vote. That's huge because now, of course, Africans could actually vote in this election. And in the spirit of cooperation, Nelson Mandela chooses de Klerk as his vice president. Now, why on earth would Mandela choose de Klerk as his vice president. He did it in the spirit of reconciliation. That, you know, Mandela was so popular, people adored him. If he said everybody torch the place, they would have done it. But he didn't want that. He wanted to forgive and forget. And here's a man after 27 years in prison, falsely in prison for 27 years, who comes out appoints the former president his vice president and focuses on rebuilding and reconciliation, um, which is, I think, what makes Nelson Mandela a remarkable person. Now, he would live to be, oh gosh, he passed away just a couple of years ago. So, you know, I think he was close to 100, uh, maybe mid-late 90s. I'd have to look exactly when he passed away. But uh, he would be president. Now, South Africa today still struggles. Years and years and years of uh, institutionalized racism and, 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 and so many people at, 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 at uh, tremendous disadvantages.
it's going to take several generations for South Africa to sort of overcome that. So that being said, that'll be where we will stop. And um, you know, if you're interested in this topic, I would recommend you watching my lecture on India and uh, the story of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, or Mohandas, as he was known by name. Mahatma, I believe, was the title. Um, uh, you're more than welcome to watch that, and I uh, want to thank you again for having a look, and we will see you uh, next time. Cheers. Thanks.